Thanks for everyone for, for taking the interest in, in the work that, we, that we're doing in South Africa. Um, it's, it's a super exciting industry. It's, it's so energetic. Um, it's, just, it's going to be nice to share some of the projects that we've been working on over the last uh, 20 years. Jill and I have been partners for um, 20 years now, and so I've asked her to participate in this more of a conversation. Um, so if at any time uh, you guys <clears throat> have a question, I either put your hand up or, or um, you know, just have a shout out so that, that we can I have no problems with going into a tangent uh, and explaining uh, anything that you need further explanations on. Um, with that, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, it's, a, it's a PowerPoint presentation. Um, Can you see that? Is it the wrong one? Yeah, um, looking good. Is that the one? Is, are you seeing the right one? That's a um, parts and labor. Seeing, yeah, seeing the parts and labor screen. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, we're going to. Sorry, I'm just setting up my desktop here. There you go. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the contemporary cultural sector within South Africa, um, a little bit of history and also what's happening now with uh, COVID-19. Um, I'll then go into the, a melting pot of creative industries uh, where, where Jill and I have really been uh, actively involved in, um, from fashion, furniture des design, uh, collaborative studios, um, and working with contemporary fine artists. Um, I'll then go into a couple of projects that I've worked on um, for parts and labor, and then I will finish off with the virtual tour that we did for the Nelson Mandela capture site. Um, hey, are there any questions so far or, or are we, we good to go? We are good. You're good. Okay. All right. So just to orientate you guys. South Africa is the southern tip of, of South Africa. It takes about 45 hours to fly there from Regina, uh, which, is, which is an epic journey. Um, our, our two major cities is Cape Town, which probably most of you are familiar with, um, and Johannesburg, the city of gold. You can kind of comparatively compare them, Johannesburg being Toronto and Cape Town being... Um, South Africa is very much a city of extremes, from leafy suburbs with multi-million dollar houses to um, city slums in Cape Town. This one is called Kailicha, uh, where people live on $35 a month. Um, this, this population would, is probably half a million people that would live in, would live in an area. Uh, in Kailicha. Um, so it's kind of no wonder why South Africa is ranked fifth uh, active cases for, for COVID-19 infections because of your, your close proximity to living conditions, your lack of water, right, you know, and so forth. Um, our extremes of geographical uh, savannas, uh, semi-deserts, mountain landscapes, subtropical forests, grass savannas, uh, you know, it's, it's an incredibly varied country. And you kind of take uh, Canada, which is ginormous, and you really compress it into basically a day's drive. Um, and that's, that's really South Africa's geographical footprint. Um, it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Wonderful to, to be a tourist there. Absolutely staggering, actually, because it fluctuates so much and it's so close. Oh. I mean, within a couple of hours, you'll, you'll, you'll change from one biome to another completely different biome. Uh, so, yeah, as a tourist, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a great place to visit. Um, okay, so a couple of uh, very influential people, uh, South Africans. Uh, of course, Nelson Mandela, um, Trevor Noah, Charlie Theron, Elon Musk, uh, who started PayPal, Tesla, Hyperloop. 
X, you know, he's, he's kind of leading the way uh, on many different fronts. Uh, then you have Christian Barnard, who was the first South African to successfully, was first person to successfully do a human heart transplant. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a photograph of uh, Christian Barnard and Hamilton Naki, who was his um, surgical assistant. Uh, and Hamilton Naki was a, a black South African uh, who didn't get any recognition for the work that he did. Uh, and he was essentially, he didn't go through medical school. He was essentially a self-taught um, a professional. And only recently was he recognized for the work that he's done. Um, moving on to artists like William Kentridge, um, performers, Brenda Fassi, and um, I don't know if any of you know uh, Johnny Clegg. Uh, he's from a band called Zavuka, which at one time he was more popular than Michael Jackson. And there's a story where uh, Michael Jackson and Johnny Clegg were playing in Lyon in France, and Michael Jackson's concert was cancelled due to lack of ticket sales and the popularity of uh, Johnny Clegg. And the next day, the, the newspaper article read, the people of Lyon prefer the white person who has become black to the black person who has become white, which was, which was quite funny. Um, okay, so the melting pot of creative industries. Um, the, the South African cultural industry is overseen by the Department of Arts and Culture, which was more recently amalgamated uh, to include the Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, which is quite a considerable portfolio. And unfortunately, um, the department uh, isn't very good at administration and provides very, very little support uh, to the industry. However, it is very good at uh, developing institutions uh, or architectural institutions such as this, um, it's about a hundred billion dollar hundred million dollar um, uh, museum complex called Freedom Park, um, which has won uh, design awards. Uh, we then have the Ezekiel um, set of museums in the Western Cape, which consists of the South African Na National Gallery, which is really your, um, our, our leading national contemporary gallery. Um, and it also has, are you guys still there? I'm having a little screen blip. Can you see my screen? Sorry, I was muted there. We can kind of see like the presenter view. Okay, let me just um, share that screen. Sorry, I, my computer went into. What did you say? Let me do that again. Right. Okay, you should be back. Yeah. Right, you back? Yeah. Okay, so. Um, This, the South African National Art Gallery, which is kind of our leading contemporary art gallery, um, which puts on fantastic exhibitions. They, they control the, um, the planetarium and a number of other historical institutions. This is the Constitution Hill Complex, uh, which is based in Johannesburg. Uh, it forms part of an inner city museum complex, uh, which originally housed the, the battlements, uh, which the British armies developed in, in uh, Johannesburg, um, including the women's jail uh, and section four, which um, Nelson Mandela and Gandhi both spent time as prisoners in. Um, unfortunately, again, you know, the, um, what an amazing museum complex, uh, excellent exhibition design and architecture, but unfortunately the operational 
um, side of things is, is quite lacking, uh, which is pretty consistent throughout a number of these types of institutions. Um, another example of that would be the Johannesburg Art Gallery, which is situated uh, on the inner city of Johannesburg, which is essentially um, uh, um, Hello. Yeah, pretty much a no-go area for a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of urban slums around the area, uh, and it's the Johannesburg Art Gallery is really turned into a community center for um, or a safe place for a lot of. Uh, the collection itself consists of works from uh, Picasso, Renoir, Miro, Andy, um, Andy Warhol, Chuck Close. I mean, it's it's an absolutely astounding collection that dates back about a hundred years. Um, but unfortunately, the building is uh, collapsing. Uh, the roof is leaking. Uh, it's just, it's, it's in an awful state. Of, um, it's in a really awful state. Um, I thought to include this exhibition. It's an, it's an outdoor exhibition uh, that was sponsored by the Department of Arts and Culture. It consists of about 800 life-sized bronzes of leaders, South African leaders, influential leaders, from the time Jan van Riebeck landed in, in at the Cape Coast in the 1500s, all the way through to contemporary South Africa. And all the characters are walking in one direction. The, the exhibition is called The Long March to Freedom, which is a play on Nelson Mandela's book, The Long Walk to Freedom. And it's, it's really emotive. Um, each character has a, a write-up, um, uh, where you can read about what they did as part of the uh, of part of their contribution to to history or South Africans' history, uh, it's just it's just wonderful. Um, uh, here's a more recent uh, and a detailed shot just to show you the kind of the quality of bronze work that has gone into it. And, you know, including the patinas that I think that it's just astounding. Um, and then we have the South African Pavilion in Venice, the, which is the Venice Biennial. Uh, they send over a, a, a team of, of an architecture team and a, and a content art team every, every year. Um, this again, you know, it's, it's, it's a huge pity because there's, there's a massive amount of architectural and contemporary art talent in South Africa. The way in which the uh, Southern Pavilion has been set up uh, is incredibly bureaucratic and it receives very, very little financial support. Um, I've been part of the, the last three pavilions um, as a project manager. Our budget vary from between $300,000 to $700,000, and we have typically anything between three months and seven months to set up, to design, set up, install, and execute a, an international exhibition, which is incredibly uh, difficult to do. Uh, but we've had some successes, and, uh, and I'll talk through them uh, later on in the slideshow. Um, going on to private institutions, uh, this is by far the largest and probably most well-known um, contemporary gallery, a uh, private gallery in South Africa. It's called the Zeitz Mocha, uh, which is, stands for the Museum of Contemporary African Arts. Um, it's situated in the VNA waterfront, uh, which is visited by 35 million visitors per year. Um, this building was finished probably two or three years ago um, and, and has um, started to feature uh, very well-known exhibitions. Um, and it's all managed from within the, port, the, the waterfront um, the portfolio, property portfolio. So it's, it's all privately funded. Uh, this is a, an image of the interior of that building, uh, which is just incredible. Um, I'm just going to go back one slide. The, the building itself is made up of a series of grain silos, um, kind of squashed together. and on the inside of that building, they've kind of taken an ice cream scoop and just scooped out uh, uh, those grain silos, um, creating this really magnificent atrium. 
this is in Cape Town. Uh, another Cape Town uh, uh, foundation is the Norval Foundation, uh, also recently built and launched probably two years ago. Another museum that was being privately funded, uh, a very wealthy uh, construction family uh, wanted to um, build some houses in the Cape Winelands, and the city council said, "You may do that, but you have to build a uh, you have to build an, a museum complex." And so they created the Norval Foundation. Uh, also, world class facilities. Um, going on to the apartheid museum, it's a it's a not really a contemporary gallery, more of a museum that documents apartheid from the 1800s to contemporary South Africa, probably around 2005. It's probably one of the most visited uh, tourist museums in South Africa, um, getting about 800 people a day, um, mostly international tourists and uh, school groups. Um, they've, they've got a very uh, active um, school program and upwards of you know, 200 kids at a time would arrive and, and um, you know, go through that museum. You probably need three days uh, to go through that museum. It's incredibly dense uh, with content. It's incredibly uh, emotional um, yeah, uh, and, and thoughtful. I mean, it's, 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 it's quite an experience to go through that. And heartbreaking. Uh, then we have smaller museums. Uh, Nelson Mandela House, which is where Nelson Mandela lived on Vilakazi Street in Soweto which is just outside of Johannesburg. It uh, stands for Southwestern Townships. It's a tiny little museum, very cute. Um, they've recently launched a virtual tour of the museum, um, which, which I can share with you guys later. It's well worth going through uh, and, and taking a look at it. Um, then we have the Nelson Mandela Capture Site. Uh, this is the visitor center. I've been part of this project uh, right from the very beginning uh, in 2007, uh, where we initially uh, built this uh, sculpture of Nelson Mandela, uh, and it marks the point where Nelson, Mas Nelson Mandela was captured in 1962. Um, and it comprises of 50, uh, um, 50 columns, which all come together in, into focus. Uh, I'll show you some images later on in the slide to give you an indication of what it looks like when it's exploded. Um, and then the Javit Art Foundation, also a new um, institution uh, that forms part of the University of Pretoria. Uh, I, this opened in September last year, and all of these institutions are closed uh, because of COVID-19. They've been closed for five months. We have no idea when they're going to be opened. Um, or how they're going to open in what form. Uh, because they are privately funded, uh, we don't know when that, what's going to happen with that funding. A lot of them still have operational expenses uh, that they, you know, they still have to pay for staff and cleaning and lights and water and that kind of stuff. So uh, with South Africa being one of the most hardest hit countries in the world, and uh, tourist travel effectively being closed probably until April next year. We won't receive any, any tourists. Uh, these museums are in a huge state. Uh, uh, and I don't know what the solution is uh, to, to allow these institutions to survive. Um, everything keeps on changing. Um, and so it's incredibly difficult to, to navigate this terrain at, at the moment. Um, going on to our kind of our, our, our smaller creative industries, we have um, fashion labels like Guillotine, Black Coffee, Max Corsa, and this is Max Corsa wearing his design uh, on the streets of Paris. Uh, furniture. Uh, studios. This is a, a husband and wife team, Doctor and Mrs., which is just wild. Uh, another another series of their work by Doctor and Mrs. Um, going on to Hotlander, uh, who's got some inspiration from uh, Bender Weavers, uh, which is 
they're situated north of uh, South Africa. Um, and this bench has been all over the world uh, on, on trade exhibitions. Um, it's just beautiful. Another bench by Hotlander, another bench by Tonic, one of my favorite uh, benches. It was voted the most beautiful object in South Africa a number of years ago. Um, uh, this lamp by Joe Payne, just really playful, got beautiful design details in it. Um, you know, you shine it down, shine it onto the wall, you know, it completely just changes the lighting aesthetic. Uh, this is a design studio called Mima Design. Uh, and in this instance, she's, she kind of pioneered taking aluminum mesh, powder coating it, and embossing it uh, to create these most amazing and intricate uh, uh, lampshades. Um, moving on to Gregor Jenkins and some steel work. That table is probably one meter wide and four meters long. Um, and it's just an exquisite piece of engineering in itself uh, on, on how they kept it intact. Um, there's a number of collaborative studios from Workhorse Bronze Foundry uh, that works with a number of different artists and the David Crook Workshop where Bill works, uh, who's also a collaborative print studio um, uh, who publish uh, prints. Um, and then you have the kind of contemporary artists that are really being recognized on the world stage. Uh, this is uh, Mohao Morisikeng. Um, and showing a work of his that was at the um, Venice Bernal for 2017. Tracy Rose, who was in the Venice Bernal for 2019. William Kentridge, whose uh, this particular work uh, is has been purchased by the National Art Gallery in Ontario um, and can be seen as part of their collection. Um, Lady Scully, who, who's really a disruptor. She's a, she's a young artist that is just uh, tearing the industry apart with all kinds of questions and uh, challenges. Uh, she's doing phenomenally well for herself. Zanele Mohali and uh, Faith 47, who's, who's an internationally recognized um, mural artist uh, that has done murals all over the world. Um, an incredibly beautiful and sensitive uh, done. Um, and then Pamela Fantismo, uh, who's a Zimbabwean born artist working in Johannesburg and Ontario. So, I mean, you can see, you know, like, you know there's just a breadth and depth uh, or to, the, the, to the creative arts. Uh, they're just kind of exploding. We kind of attribute that to um, the amount of tension that is in a place like South Africa, whether it's economic tension, whether it's social tension, whether it's racial tension, all these tensions thrown into this kind of melting pot kind of causes this uh, stimulus of, of ideas and really a hassle. Uh, people are out there to hustle uh, and to make something and uh, you don't need a qualification you just got to do it uh, that's 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 really what um, the, the streets of, of South Africa are like um, another artist Maya Malevich um, who's who started to do a lot of collaborative work with uh, other studios like something good who who's producing um, her, a series of her blankets and so there's this, there's a lot of cross pollination between these um, between these industries between artists. Uh, we all we all working together in in some form uh, or another as small little uh, pockets. Um, and and they've been doing some quite amazing things. And, and yeah, amazing product. Um, I think that the, the real challenge is trying to get that product onto an international stage and an international audience. I think that's, that's, one of our, that's one of our biggest challenges. Technology has been a huge problem. And it's hard to read. Okay. Hard to reach, there's, there's this kind of this big unknown. I think within the, the contemporary art side of things, that industry has by far been the most successful. Um, galleries have been able to uh, join the international circuits uh, and and um, feature South African artists on fairs like Art Basel, 
uh, Documenta, um, uh, print fairs in New York. So they've by far had a, had a much wider uh, reach and, and success. Um, okay, arts and labor. Are there any, have there been any questions so far? Or any, anything that I need to go back to or, you know? Nothing coming up in the chat yet, Nothing but coming. yeah, okay. super interesting, thank you. <laughs> okay, all right, so parts and labor. Uh, parts and labor is, is it's, a, it's a teeny tiny uh, cultural project management company. Essentially, it consists of, of myself um, and, and um, Liesl Potkieter, who's, uh, who started interning with me a number of years ago. Um, and we work in the cultural sector any specific area of um, so we work in public art uh, sculpture murals uh, exhibition designs whether it's um, uh, an art exhibition or a cultural museum kind of exhibition. kind of across the board it's a, it's a relatively small industry um, and I think the the benefit of working as a as a freelance contractor is um, the ability to be flexible um, instead of working in a in a large organization with large overheads those projects become cost prohibitive um, and it also allows parts and labor to be selective as to which professionals we want to work with at any one time so um, with in in a lot of the projects uh, you're working with architects um, uh, landscape designers engineers quantities quantity surveyors, and depending on the type of project that we're working on, we can pull in a engineer who we think will be the most suitable uh, for that kind of uh, job. Um, all these kind of sculptures have different dynamics to them. Um, and it's really important working with an engineer who understands the aesthetic value or requirement that the artist needs. Uh, it's, it would be catastrophic if there's a bolt in the wrong place, for example engineer knows that he can't put that bolt there it's, it's really uh, we've got to hide it in some way and so the form really has to lead that that conversation and so parts and labor kind of you know curates uh, those those conversations and and pulls all of those people together uh, to produce uh, the to produce this and execute those projects so um, we manage the the South African Pavilion in Venice uh, for 2015, 2017, and 2019. Um, this was 2015, which, which included about 12 or 13 different artists, um, uh, uh, which is now on exhibit as part of the permanent collection as the, at the Apartheid Museum, and can be seen there. Um, this is an exhibition from 2019, uh, which included three artists, um, Tracy Rose, Mwanda Kanzeli, and Deneo Sheshe Bopape. And uh, then by far the most successful of all of the, the, the um, pavilions was the one in 2017, which was an exhibition by Candice Bright and Mohal Morrissey King. And we were, we were voted as part of the top 10 exhibitions to see that year uh, in Venice, which was a huge achievement uh, considering the lack of time and the lack of support that, that we did receive from, from our arts uh, organization, uh, the Department of Arts and Culture. Um, this is an exhibition that we, we did for the Nelson Mandela Capture Site inside the Visitor Center. It, consist, it consists of a 20 meter long light box table and inside that table are, uh, is text, artifacts, monitors, earphones that you can pick up and listen to uh, audio. Um, and around the room is a 60 meter long synchronized video. So as you are walking around the table, along the chapters, chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, you read the content, look at the objects and the artifacts and watch uh, the, the video. 
and I'll play you a video later on in the presentation through the um, through the virtual tour. A little bit uh, closer up. Oh, no. Sorry, my screen's done it again. Could you bear with me while I sort that out again? No worries. Okay, do you, can you see that the exhibition again? Yep, all good. Okay, um, so this is, um, uh, you can see a close up of the table, um, uh, monitors, text, uh, documents, original documents, replicas uh, of the document. Uh, and again, this museum was opened in December 2019 and closed three months later uh, due to COVID-19, uh, uh, closed in March. Uh, and we, we've put in an application to the government to reopen, uh, but uh, we're still waiting for, uh, for that. Um, this is the sculpture that, that I was project manager for um, in 2007. Uh, it's done phenomenally well. Just about everyone that um, that we speak to is has seen this image in some form or another. Um, and there it is from the side. You can see the fifty the fifty columns um, ramping up, and only at one particular point do you see uh, the image come together in in that form. It's, it's an incredibly emotive um, installation. Um, yeah, and and there it is during construction number of years ago. Um, this is called a Synapse 2. It's a, a sculpture 20 meters high from rusted steel by Marco Cianfanelli, um, which, is, which is based in Santon, which is our financial district and probably the richest square mile in, in, in Africa. Uh, there's a picture of it during its installation, kind of giving you a little bit more sense of, of, of the scale uh, and, and the height of it. Um, this exhibition is uh, at the Javit uh, Art Museum. Uh, it is of the Mapungubwe Gold Collection. Mapungubwe is a, it's an area in South Africa uh, that essentially where uh, north of the country where Botswana, Zimbabwe and South Africa um, join uh, on the Limpopo River. Um, and there was a, an incredibly diverse um, population of people living there, of traders living there, I don't know, a couple of hundred years ago. And uh, they produced this, these exquisite gold artifacts uh, that are essentially pieces of foil that were found in uh, excavated graves. And those foils had to be put together. Uh, painstakingly, they, they didn't know what they were putting together, but they put them together. Um, and they, they think what, they, what was made was this uh, rhino, the bovine, and the feline, being the most famous of all of those uh, items, together with the scepter uh, and the bowl. Uh, and we worked on an exhibition. Um, oh, there's a there's a close up of the rhino. I mean, you you can you can hold those little guys in your hand. That's how that's how kind of small they are and intricate they are. Um, they were they were formed. These gold foils were formed over uh, wooden uh, carvings. That's that's kind of how they how they kind of molded them on, onto a form. Of course, the wood doesn't exist anymore. They, they rotted away. Um, and then, so this is the this is the exhibit that we designed for them. It's a two meter by three meter oval table glass cabinet, um, which is housed in a, in a, in a quite a dark uh, room. 
Um, and because of the, 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 the dark room and the glass and the lights, it's, it's incredibly reflective. Uh, so you can kind of see this kind of sparkly um, reflection happening, which it's just, when people walk into the room, they, they, they initially are loud and they're chatty and then they just go quiet. They just hush. And then they talk in hushes from then onwards until they leave again. I mean, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's, it's extraordinary to, to see it. Um, this is a photograph uh, from the side of the, the, the cabinet, um, looking into it, um, uh, and you can kind of see some of the artifacts. It's very difficult to, to photograph it, um, just because of the, the, the contrast between dark and light. Uh, this is quite a fun project. It's called Drawings in the Sky. Uh, this is uh, 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 Absa Bank owns a, a building, one of the tallest buildings in, in Johannesburg in a city. Um, and at one point uh, in the building's history, they installed a, um, a giant uh, LED TV screen. Uh, this is about five meters, five stories high. Uh, one of the largest monitors in the Southern Hemisphere. At one point when they were testing uh, the lights, um, it was causing people to wake up in the middle of the night five kilometers away because it was beaming through their, it was beaming through their bedroom uh, window so brightly. Anyway, we had the, the, the fortunate uh, the fortune to work with ABSA to develop a series of um, drawings in the sky, uh, which was exhibited over a period of a week um, during the Joburg Art Fair. Um, and we did that for three years in a, in a row. Um, where so we, we invited um, it was about four or five artists at a time to develop a series of animated drawings, which would then be broadcast to an inner city of probably two million people uh, that would come in and out uh, of the city per day. So, you know, great platform for artists uh, and, and quite wonderful to work on. Uh, this is one of the video works by an artist called Stephen Hobbs which is a kaleidoscope. Um, if you know his work, you'll, you'll be able to appreciate it a lot more. Um, and then uh, this artwork, which I loved, with one of my favorite ones, which is by Simon Gash, which was this ceiling fan just spinning. Uh, and that was broadcast on top of the building uh, above two million people just saying, hey, you know, cool down. <laughs> Um, and then the this is a project that we worked on called the the home movie uh, the home movie factory, which was uh, developed by Michael Gondry, who is a French movie director, um, famous for uh, uh, directing Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, and he came up with this concept where the general public would book a time slot at the home movie factory, which was essentially a movie set. Uh, you develop with you and your friends, you develop a, a, um, a theme and you get your costumes and you get given a video camera and you go from set to set to set and you, you film yourself and you have a whole lot of fun. Uh, quite a wonderful project to, to work on and, and manage. Um, and then I was the, the technical director for the Johannesburg Art Fair for, for three years um, in 2008, nine and 10. Um, uh, this was one of my first public artworks that I managed. It's called Irland, which is kind of our equivalent of the Canadian moose. It's a 50 ton concrete sculpture that stands about seven meters high. Uh, and it's kind of, it's, it was done by uh, Kai van den Berg. Uh, and it was his kind of take on what was there as in Johannesburg, grasslands, wild life, nature, antelopes, uh, and what is uh, currently there. So you can see the use of concrete as a, as a building material and kind of grid uh, patterns uh, on, the, on the body of the airlines as, um, as the street grids. Uh, then this is a steel artwork called Pages outside a library, uh, which is really just pages in motion. Um, we've done staircases uh, uh, out of tile mosaics. Uh, this is a, a wooden sculpture that stands 2.1 meters high. 
it's two and a half meters, 2.7 meters wide, and it's five meters long uh, along the diagonal. It's a magnificent piece of wood uh, uh, made from uh, key art, uh, which is a which is an indig indigenous African wood, um, and it was commissioned by First National Bank, whose um, logo is a an acacia tree, which is a very uh, uh, symbolic uh, tree in in South Africa. You can see this is kind of the silhouette of the tree uh, with the with the the rays kind of moving down in a diagonal pattern. Uh, this is another version of that, um, this time made out of mild steel. Again, you can see the, the, the silhouette in the, in the front face, but this time it's just extruded uh, uh, backwards. Um, and again, uh, for F&B Bank, uh, which is now positioned in their headquarters in, in Johannesburg. Uh, another uh, public artwork uh, in, in Nyrox Arts, it's another view of that. Uh, and then kind of lastly, the, this is a, a series of murals that have been commissioned, uh, which is going up currently in, in Johannesburg in, in um, the inner city in a place called Mabaneng. Um, and this is a graffiti artist called uh, D. Bongs. And here he is putting the kind of the finishing touches on, on his artwork. Okay, so that's that's kind of parts and labor uh, and kind of the scope and of work that we, that we deal with. Um, never really a dull moment. Each project is so unique. Uh, it's so diverse, working with so many different types of people from from engineers to artists to clients to architects to landscapes. It's, I mean, it's, it's it's been quite wonderful being able to work in such a space. Okay. Um, now, if you guys are ready, I can go on to the, the, the capture site. Um, are there any other questions? Good to go? Good to go. Everybody's okay. just enjoying it. <laughs> okay, good. Um, okay, so this is, this is the kind of the future vision for the Nelson Mandela capture site. Just try and move this. Um, the, the site is, is massive. Uh, it's, it's in the middle of um, it's in the it's in the KwaZulu Natal Midlands uh, between Durban and Johannesburg, along the our old main highway. Um, so it's 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 really a two lane road uh, built in the 1920s, um, and uh, Mandela was travelling back from Durban, considering to start an armed resistance. And at the time, the CIA was in the country and they were monitoring his whereabouts and they notified the South African police services uh, of, his, of his traveling. And the, the South African police ended up picking him up um, and arresting him, and which led to his 27 years incarceration. So the site itself is the, the marker along that road that, that, um, that just that memorializes that moment in history. Uh, the sculpture uh, along the road is that little red dot over there. Um, there's the long walk to freedom, the visitor center, uh, which you've seen in photographs. And then all of this other stuff uh, was earmarked for development this year. Uh, we had 15 million rand from KwaZulu-Natal Tourism to upgrade, uh, put in a paved road and a paved parking lot. At the moment, it's, it's all gravel and, and mud, essentially, depending on the time of the year. Um, the Department of Environmental Affairs and Tourism were giving us um, another 15 million rand to develop an experiential garden, clean up the wetlands, um, uh, put in a education, facility uh, to to welcome school groups all of that was supposed to happen this year uh, all of it is on hold we have no idea uh, if that money is still going to be available or not uh, the assumption is that most of those projects are going to be put on hold uh, whilst that money is is going to be diverted for uh, disaster management and disaster relief we don't know for how many years 
uh, I haven't received an email from either of those project managers in five months. There's just absolute silence, uh, which is incredibly tragic because the, the future vision for the site was just amazing. What it was going to offer uh, not only the locals but the international tourism. Uh, our our kind of way of thinking was that it shouldn't be just for international tourists uh, coming in, traveling between uh, Johannesburg and, and Durban, but really uh, developing a local site where we encourage locals to come back three or four or five times a year. Uh, so. There was an amphitheater planned for concerts. There was an experiential garden. There was a, um, a Saturday uh, farmer's market planned. Uh, you know, there was bike tracks going off into the, uh, the forests. Um, yeah, you, can see the, you can see the bike tracks going off. And that was joining us an extensive network of, you know, more than 50 kilometers of bike track. All of it's on hold. Nothing is happening, um, so we just so we're just waiting, really. Uh, and that's kind of a just a a closer view of 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 our plans. So in the meantime, whilst we have been on lockdown uh, and uh, we've been trying to keep busy um, and allow people to still kind of participate in in the site. Um, and we've, we've done that by developing the Nelson Mandela Capture Site virtual tour, um, which, which Parts and Labor developed. Um, I, had to, I had to learn coding <laughs> to do this. We didn't have budget to, to pay anyone else. Uh, so I pulled the short straw and, and spent two months, a month and a half, learning coding, assembling uh, various bits of of imagery uh, that we could that we could get. No one was allowed on site. It was closed. No one was allowed to travel provincially between borders. Uh, if you needed to go to work, you needed a permit to do so. I mean, the country was on on proper lockdown. So, so whilst all of this was happening, um, we developed this this virtual tour. Um, so let me just a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the about section really takes you through the site, uh, what it looks like, it kind of gives you an orientation. There's the visitor center, uh, the entrance to the visitor center, uh, inside uh, the reception hall. Uh, this is a beaded panel of Nelson Mandela, which is about three meters high by two and a half meters wide, uh, and was beaded by uh, Impimolello beads took them. It was about four ladies taking about five or six months to to bead. I don't know how many hundred thousand beads, individually hand stitched. Um, inside the exhibition center, this is the long walk to freedom, which is a pathway that leads you from the uh, visitor center down to the sculpture and back again. And along the long walk to freedom, there's a number of um, uh, information panels that give you insight into moments in Mandela's um, life. Uh, again, the sculpture. Walking through the sculpture and looking um, back up, at, up and out at it. Um, okay, so I'm going to take you into, into the main exhibition hall, uh, where there's a, there's a 360 degree panorama, uh, which is essentially that 20 meter long table uh, filled with artifacts. Um, and I'm going to play you a video just to give you a sense of how long and how detailed that table is.
um, and then I'm going to play you a video. Um, I think it's this one. So it's a little bit of a lag. Okay. See the you see the table and all the screens are playing in a synchronized format. Okay, um, go back. The, the video that I'm going to play next is this is going to give you a better sense of the exhibition space itself and the table in relation to the projections. Very difficult to film because of the contrast of the space um, and the, the brightness of the, the table, so uh, it's, it's very hard to get on camera. It's something that we've been constantly struggling with uh, during our technical uh, tests and development. Um, so I'm going to play now that, that video. So I think there are um, the same different screens all played at once. Yeah. So there are three parts. Uh, one is um, of the arm and it was probably um, along the, the, the R103 where he was arrested. Um, and at the same time, we've infused kind of snippets of, of history of what's happening in the country at the time he was driving um, and being politically active. Can you guys hear the audio? We can. I think there's uh, occasionally times here when your voice gets a little choppy when the video is playing. But... Okay. Is that better? Sorry, I forgot to turn the video. Okay, you can, you can start seeing that uh, these snippets of yeah, start coming. The fire want the franchise. On the basis of one man, one vote, they want political independence. We have made it very clear in our policy that uh, South Africa is the country of many races. There is room for. Move forward to uh, part two, uh, which is really where Nelson Mandela is. I have checked. To where he was held the idea for how many years? of a democracy and free society in which all persons will live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an idea for which I hope to live in and to see realized what we love. If it is a big, it is a material for which I am prepared to die. Quite aware of 
Sorry, I'll just finish up to you for a second. Uh, we can't hear you talking when oh. the video is on. There we go. Yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. So in, in developing the, the footage um, uh, in relation to the table, we have to be very aware of, of, of the footage not being overpowering. Uh, we, were, we were quite worried that people being uh, very visual and, and screen orientated were just going to walk into the exhibition and, and, and watch the screens. Um, and it was actually the other way around. They are absolutely immersed into the table and the content of the table um, whilst whilst the film plays a background which was exactly what uh, which is exactly what we wanted um, so this is just it's providing supplementary information and little snippets so when you you look up you can you can see those bits of history and and get those uh, tiny bits of audio recording um, going into part three um, is uh, let me just find it is is Mandela's release uh, from prison uh, and the events that happened thereafter? To achieve political ends. My father says, I cannot and will not give any an undertaking at a time when I and you, the people, are not free. Your freedom and mine cannot be separated. At, at this point of the, the film, you are standing in the exhibition and you're surrounded by the sea uh, of mass protesting and the audio just culminates and it's, it's, it's quite amazing to, to uh, feel that. Um, it kind of makes you feel part of that, that mass action. Um, and so that then it kind of ends off um, with Nelson Mandela voting. Uh, South Africa voting, and then it kind of loops back to the very beginning, um, where where he's driving through the through the Midlands. So, so throughout this exhibition, we've uh, we've got all these these films and audio pieces. Um, I'm going to play you one more of that, and then we we're just about done. Um, this is a it's a video of um, when Nelson Mandela came back to the capture site uh, after. Uh, he was president, um, and he's he's sitting on the side of the road in in a car with a megaphone, uh, and he's recalling the events of his arrest. Um, his, it's a little bit difficult to understand if you don't know his voice, um, and so there are subtitles to kind of help you. As we reach this place, a new Ford car. Uh, flashed past our car and then uh, uh, indicated to us that we should stop. And Cecil William, who was a well known playwright, said, What is? And I say, Why do us? Because it's clear who they are. A tall gentleman came out of this wrong car and uh, walked up to us. The way he looked at us, he seemed to not to be sure at that time who we were. He then took out his warrant of authority and introduced himself and said, I am Sergeant Foster from uh, the Peter Marisberg Police. What is your name? I said, my name is David Mutsamai, which was my common name. Yeah. He then said, are you not Mr. Mandela? I said, I have given you a name. He said, ah, you are Mr. Mandela, and that is Cecil William. You are under arrest. I was eventually brought to court and he went five years. So there's, you know, there's lots of those kind of videos uh, throughout the exhibition, um, largely um, found from from archives, uh, historical archives, um, either South African Broadcasting Corporation or BBC or um, or the likes. Um, this this exhibition was was um, uh, curated by the Apartheid Museum, uh, who also operates the the Nelson Mandela capture site. 
um, and, and has done so for about 10 years without any income. They've kind of just, they've funded it out of their own purse. We were only able to start charging in December. And then unfortunately, like I said, we had to close our doors and stop ticketing. Um, so the, the last part of the tour that I want to show you is the, the 360 of the, the sculpture. So this kind of uh, orientates you. The, unfortunately, the quality of these 360s um, are so poor because um, we weren't able to go to site with the, with the high res um, uh, camera. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I guess the reason why we're here is because of, of, of COVID-19. Um, South Africa went into a lockdown uh, in, at the end of March. Um, Jill and I kind of saw what was going to happen. We, we lived in, in Taiwan for, um, for a year where the, there was an outbreak of SARS happening. Um, and so within, within three days, we packed up and, and we flew out. You know? and, and so now we're in Regina. We have no idea how long we're going to be here for. Uh, our original estimate, we thought we'd be here for the summer, for three months. Uh, that got ex extended to February. And the way things are going, um, uh, and participating in a, in a recent tourism conference, I think they'll only open uh, international tourism uh, closer to um, April of next year. So uh, we've got some time to spend in Regina and um, like. this is where my family's from. So we are lucky enough to have been able to move between South Africa and Canada for quite a long time. Kind of here we are. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> eager to eager to do stuff. Yeah. Thank you so much for your presentation and and sharing all that, it was really interesting to get a better understanding of what you do and culture in South Africa and all that. Yeah, um, we can open it up now if anybody has any questions, uh, feel free to, to jump in the chat there. Definitely uh, getting some comments about how awesome it was and thank you for sharing and uh, people are gonna check out the virtual tour. I, I had a question actually um, mm. in, the mean, in the meantime here. Um, I was wondering, um, it, this, am I correct in assuming this was your first time creating a virtual exhibition? Yes, yes it was. Yeah. It was all, uh, all very new to me. Um, and I think because um, not being able to go to site and having uh, access, full access to site, we weren't able to create a typical virtual uh, exhibition where if you imagine a gallery space and then you kind of you move from place to place to place um, along the gallery or the, the museum uh, we had to kind of formulate another way of presenting it as a, as a virtual ex exhibition so you, you can't walk around the table we only had one uh, 360 in the middle of the table and that kind of was the basis of where we had to start from uh, in, in developing it I think I built that a virtual tour 11 different times uh, in order to kind of figure out the most effective way of uh, of the audience being able to go through it and, and see it and it, I mean from what we started out with with being extremely inexperienced to what we ended up with I thought well, we didn't do too badly yeah uh, it's uh, you know I've, I've definitely gone through a few different virtual exhibits especially in the last few months and 
I, I definitely think you really get a sense of, I, I feel like you get a sense of the space when you're, when you're going through the tour that you've done. So yeah, con oh, congratulations great. on that. It's, it's a really, it's a really interesting tour to do. I think, yeah, he'll definitely have a few, a few hits on it after this for sure. <laughs> I hope so. And I think what I'll do is um, I'll I'll share the um, I'll share the Mandela House virtual tour tour two, uh, which could also be accessed via the, um, the the Mandela Capture Site website. There, there is a link to Mandela House uh, that way. It's it's a, it's a it's a more traditional type of um, virtual tour, um, but they've done it really well. Um, and I think they had the luxury there of actually being able to be in the space and, and uh, curate it um, to suit that tour. Is it something you'd ever be interested in doing again? Like, you know, maybe not due to kind of such a forced circumstances, but in, you know. Oh, oh, for sure. Um, I don't think it, it would be, uh, I, I wouldn't want it to be kind of permanent uh, type of work, but yeah, um, uh, certainly. Interesting. Well, no, no, no questions in, in particular that are coming up, just uh, people saying thank you and they very much enjoyed your presentation and, and so did I. So th thanks for your time this morning. Um, and yeah, we'll definitely be posting the, the full recording because there were a couple people who had to duck out for other meetings. Um, but yeah, really enjoyed it and really enjoyed hearing some, some perspectives from, you know, across the world and, and, you know, welcome, of course, to, to Regina and Saskatchewan and, you know, look forward to connecting with you as, as the time goes here. <laughs> Thanks, Em. Thanks, everybody. I have to say, I think most people are just so overwhelmed by what they have seen here today that they're kind of going, oh, my God. Oh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like a lot. Me, visiting South Africa once we can travel is now on my bucket list. And in the meantime, I'm going to be doing the virtual tours. Got to say, this it was it, it was really amazing. And thank you. Thank you.